to the Exploress. Time traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. In our last chapter, we got clean in Tudor England. Now that we're all rubbed and fresh, it's time to get dressed. Grab your kirtle and your favorite lacing tape. Let's go traveling. What we wear, and particularly what type of fabrics we put on our bodies, will depend a lot on our level of wealth, our social station, and the slice of Tudor history we're time-traveling back to. But we'll all be starting with the same basic base layer. It's that staple of our wardrobe, the linen smock, which we will later in history call a shift, and even later, a chemise. Yes, we did wear a chemise when we went to Victorian age America in season one. Good memory. Picture a simple nightgown. Two rectangles of linen sewn together, with two triangular bits sewn in at the sides to give it a bit of shape. This will serve as our underwear. Sure, there are European ladies who wear boxer shorts like the men do, but there's a whiff of the courtesan about it. So, if you want to start a scandal, you feel free. The linen smock serves a lot of functions. Modesty, hygiene, and comfort. Linen is made from long fibers like jute, hemp, and most commonly flax, making it strong, soft, and breathable. Hot Tudor tip, it also tends to get cold to the touch. So if you have servants, you might ask them to warm it for you by the fire of a morning. Or you might just pull it into bed with you to take the chill off. Our smock captures our sweat, which is good, because it's the only layer of our clothes strong enough to hold up under frequent washing. That's why many still call laundry baskets linen baskets in our era. Given that most of us can only lay claim to two, maybe three pairs of underwear, we can see why they'll be washed pretty often. Most of us are lucky if we have one smock to wear, one in the wash, and maybe a fancy one set aside for Sundays. You'll know, if you listen to my bonus episode on the subject, that we won't be wearing any bra. No matter. As we'll see, our outer garments will give us all the constraint we might ever want. Our hose come next. Men and women both wear them. But while men's hose tend to be on display, we want ours all covered up. They're really more like knee socks than pantyhose. It's likely that they're knitted, wool for most, and silk for the fanciest amongst us. No matter how crude or fine, though, they have no spandex in them, and that means you'll need a garter at the knee to hold them up, either knotted or closed with a teeny tiny buckle. So that's our base layer, the most critical layer of protection against exposure to the noxious air. Where we go from here, clothing-wise, depends a lot on our station. We'll get dressed with a royal lady later on in the season, but for now, let's cover the basics of what your average lady might wear. The next layer we'll be slipping on is called our kirtle. The kirtle is a full-length dress with a skirt and a snug-fitting bodice, given shape with a lining of canvas or buckram, and often reinforced with wooden rods. To secure it, we will lace it up the side or back. But how to lace it if your ties are behind you? Well, we'll use a spiral lacing technique. Don't worry, I'll talk you through it. Let's turn to our kirtle laid out on the mattress. See all those little eyelet holes and that long piece of cord? We're going to lace up our kirtle by going around in a spiral, not crisscrossing like you do with your modern running shoe. Once you've laced it loosely, just shimmy under and into it, and once it's where you want it, pull on the end of the long lace to slowly tighten it, shimmying and jiggling everything into its proper place. We might stop here if we're a working woman. The kirtle is all we really need. It's modest and sturdy, usually made of the ever-versatile wool. It'll keep us warm and is thick enough to protect against stray sparks, thorns, the sun, you name it. But we can also fancy up our kirtle, should we choose to, by our choice of material, say, or with the addition of beadwork or embellishment. We can also dress things up by wearing a gown over the top. The gown, which usually laces up the front, will generally be lower cut, with that Tudor signature square cut neckline and shorter sleeves. The gown has a big slit that starts around the navel and drops down to the floor, revealing flashes of your stylish kirtle. Or it might also show your forepart. 
Picture a square of fabric that you pin over your kirtle, kind of like a false apron. That's a four-part. Tutors are fond of adding detachable, mix-and-match details to their outfits, particularly in fancy fabrics. Detachable sleeves that match our four-part are a favorite. Why? Because, as we'll talk about shortly, fabric is crazy expensive. These detachable extras let us jazz up and freshen our outfits without breaking the bank. The other bit of flair we might add on is called a placard, a stiffened piece of chest armor that'll cover up the front ties of our gown and give us the rigid shape that comes to mind when you picture Anne Boleyn. These will be particularly handy if we're pregnant, as we can lace our gown quite loosely underneath and no one will be able to tell. Another wardrobe staple for the non-working woman is a farthingale. When Catherine of Aragon, Henry VIII's first wife, sailed over from Spain, she brought the farthingale with her. The term comes from the Spanish word vertigos, which is used to describe the smooth willow twigs that are sewn into these skirts to make them bell out a bit from a woman's legs. It's basically an early form of hoop skirt. It gives us the desired silhouette of the time, but also allows us ladies to take up a little more space and make a statement. If our King Henry VIII loves anything, it's flash. But wait, I don't remember hearing mention of buttons or zippers, so how are we keeping all these layers on our person? With the help of a whole lot of straight pins. There's a reason we ladies need our pin money. A Tudor outfit for both men and women is essentially stitched together every morning piece by piece. A laborer might only need four or five pins to hold together her clothing, while a lady hanging out at court might need up to a thousand. During her reign, Elizabeth I will have some 24,000 pins of different sizes delivered every six months. If you were to scour a fancy Tudor floor, I bet you'd find these babies everywhere. We might also fasten our clothes with what are called points, short strips of leather, cloth, or braid with metal points on both ends, kind of like our modern shoelace. Most of our points are made of silk and braided. They're strong, shiny, smooth, and a pretty affordable touch of luxury. They also make an inexpensive courting gift. We'll do more of a deep dive into Tudor fashion in a future episode, but for now, let's get going because we're dressed. Just make sure not to step too close to the fire. We tutors go to great lengths to keep our clothes in good condition, because they are precious to us in a way that many modern ladies might struggle to fathom. And so it's one we should spend some time chewing on. In this era, clothes are wildly expensive. That's in part because of how they're made. The costs of processing the raw materials, not to mention the making of the garment itself, are truly enormous. Most of England's rural landscape is devoted to sheep rearing and the production of wool. It's a staple of most of our lives and accounts for about half our nation's wealth. And yet without modern-day electric shavers, fleecing these sheep is a major operation. In our era, a skilled Australian shearer might get through 200 sheep in a day. The 16th century shearer, by contrast, working with hand shears, maybe 30. The fleece has to be beaten and hand sorted, a task often relegated to women and children. Yep, we'll have to painstakingly pick out grass, twigs, and, you know, dingleberries. There are several more steps, separating rough wool from fine, combing and oiling it before we get to spinning. This is an important job, and one done almost entirely by the ladies. It's done with a spindle and distaff, usually by hand, but it might also be done by a spinning wheel or a walking wheel, so-called because the spinster has to continually walk back and forth as she's spinning. This job might have us walking up to 30 miles a day. Ye old timey treadmill. There are no spinning factories in this era, so it's often done at home, which might provide the family with a little extra income. Someone who spins for profit is called a spinster. This term first showed up in the mid-1300s, and it becomes very gendered because most spinsters are women. For perpetually single women, it's one of the only jobs they have ready access to. That's why, by the time we get to the Regency era, the word spinster is used to describe that dowdy-looking dame by the punch bowl, single and well past marrying age. 
It takes 12 skilled spinsters working hard to produce enough yarn to keep a usually male weaver in business. It might take him six weeks to produce a single piece of cloth. The next step for the cloth is called fulling, which cleans and whitens. Know what we'll be using to do that? Great giant vats of urine. I mean, it was good enough for the Romans. If a dyer gets involved, they'll dip the cloth in natural dye, then beat or trample it to tighten the weave. Then they'll stretch it on a tenter or wooden frame with special hooks called tenter hooks. The point is to stretch it taut so that it dries at a certain legally mandated dimension. You know when someone in our era says they're on tenter hooks, aka nervously waiting, stretched taut in suspense? This is why. Remember, too, that we aren't buying ready made clothes in this era. Hats, stockings, and gloves you might buy as finished products, but pretty much everything else is made to order. You have to buy the cloth, then pay a tailor to make something for you. You can see why even the most basic outfit costs a decent coin. Let's put this in perspective. In Tudor times, the currency is made out of at least some gold and silver. The coins aren't just representing a monetary value like in our era. The precious metals in them actually make them worth what they're worth. We have no paper currency, it's all coins, and there are a lot of them. Pounds, sovereigns, crowns, half crowns, shillings, sixpence, angels, groats, pennies or pence, and more. I won't detail what they're all worth, but a few that are worth knowing for the moment. One sovereign equals one pound. A pound is 20 shillings, and a shilling is 12 pennies. Toward the end of the 16th century, an unskilled laborer will earn somewhere between 5 and 10 pounds a year. An average day laborer's wage will be 6 pennies a day. A loaf of bread will cost you about a penny, and a pound of cheese will cost one and a half. But to have a basic canvas shirt made will cost you around two shillings. That's 24 pennies in case you haven't been counting. And that equals four full days' work for the laborer. Even a worn-out second-hand shirt that you're going to use mostly as a dish rag is worth about two pennies, or a third of your day's wage. Clothes, all clothes, are in many ways a luxury item, a way of showing off your status as well as clothing your body. Take this example. Robert Dudley, Queen Elizabeth's favorite, will pay the same amount for one of his suits as William Shakespeare will pay for his house in Stratford-upon-Avon just one decade later. Textiles and clothes, almost more than anything else, underscore the huge monetary gap between the humble farmer and the nobleman. At the very top of the social scale, Henry VIII can afford to pay £1,500 for ten tapestries to decorate his walls with, while a skilled shipwright will only make about £12 a year. And these weren't even Henry's finest wall hangings. What our money can buy in Tudor times is different from what we're used to. In our era, in most countries, our food costs don't go over 10% of our total disposable income. Modern-day Nigeria probably spends the most on food at 56%. Compare all that to a Tudor household where food dominates most people's expenses. We're talking around 80% of their income. In other words, we can't always buy clothes and ale for our family. Our margins are forever minuscule, and so we have to make every shilling stretch. No wonder secondhand clothes are big business across all social classes. Clothes are so valuable that they're their own kind of currency. We don't have banks in Tudor England, but that pair of silk hose can be converted to cash by sale or pawn. A lot of people move their nicest outfits in and out of pawn, using it as a kind of loan library. In the late 1590s, theater manager Philip Henslow will lend one Mr. Crouch three pounds ten shillings against the security of his wife's nicest gown. Clothes are often bequeathed in people's wills, passed down to family members who can have them tailored to fit. You won't ever ditch a kirtle because it has a hole in the armpit. You'll patch, mend, and alter it. This is not an age of fast fashion or throwaway clothes. It's handy, then, that our outfits are made of many separate pieces. This means we can mix and match them to make our outfits feel new. A woman might have several sets of sleeves, say, that she can wear to give her look a fresh feeling, or a four-part that might give the impression of a totally new kirtle. 
Even queens do this, especially queens, as they're expected to look lavish and to never wear the same thing twice. There's one other thing we tutors need to keep in mind as we dress. Henry VIII has introduced some sumptuary laws, legal mandates that actually say who is allowed to wear what. Though most of these will only apply to men until the 1570s, when Elizabeth I takes the throne, they're still important for us to be aware of because of how they influence our interactions with others. We're living in a time that believes firmly in a clear social hierarchy and keeping everyone in their proper place. How better to tell at a glance who is who than by strictly policing who's allowed to wear what? These laws make clothes a visual signifier of your rung on the social ladder. They place you, telling others how they should interact with you. Dressing above your station can get you into serious trouble, though, of course, such things can be hard to police. Hence the rise in criminals who pull off their jobs by dressing as someone fancy. If a guy dressed like a nobleman asks you for something, you'll likely bob your head and do it without question. Never has identity theft been more easily achieved. <laughs> we'll get out a brush and untangle our hair. We won't have washed it with anything like the shampoo we use today. So how are we going to keep it from getting all greasy? There are people in our era who argue that shampoo is part of our problem, not the solution. It strips the grease and oil from our hair, and then we have to add moisture back in with some conditioner. Your scalp bumps up oil production to try and replenish the lubricating oils you just removed, which makes our hair get greasier faster. If you leave your hair to its own devices, the theory goes, your scalp will regulate its oil production, and eventually things will even out. It helps if we brush it regularly. To do this, the tutors all use a simple, vital tool, the two-sided comb. One side has wide teeth and the other very fine teeth. Here's our time-traveling companion, Ruth Goodman. If you're using the wide side, you're busy getting tangles out of your hair. It's, that's about looking good, you know, about getting yourself looking nice, getting it un it's groomed. It looks nice. The fine side is about getting nits out of your hair. It's a nit comb. It's about physically removing any parasites that are in your hair. And it works. It also helps distribute the oils through your hair from scalp to tip. Comb thoroughly twice a day and your hair will be fine, even lustrous. If you're worried, though, you might brush in some fine clay powder to absorb any excess oil or dirt. If you've got bed hair, don't stress over it. We'll have our hair almost fully covered, for modesty's sake. We'll tie it up in either a ponytail situation or a braid using lace or tapes. Then we'll pop on our linen cap, then our hood, and then possibly our veil. As the period goes on, we'll see hood shapes change, going from hexagonal to rounded, and they'll slip slowly backward, revealing more and more of our hair. The key thing to remember, though, is that loose, naked locks are associated with young women, a sign of innocence, which is why many wear it loose on their wedding day. For a married lady to leave it wafting around her shoulders is, well, pretty scandalous. Why don't we just save it for the bedchamber? So what about makeup? Very few women of any station are wearing it. We won't see its popularity rise until the 1560s. Increased trade with Italy helps fan the makeup flames, but it's also possible that its rise in popularity has another origin. Elizabeth I's bout with smallpox in 1562. It will leave her face minorly scarred, which seems to inspire her to wear more of her famous white foundation. Everyone else, at least at court, will follow suit. For them, the desired look is a pale-faced complexion. A suntan makes you look like you work in the fields, and you know that won't do. So they will coat their faces in things like lead, mercury, antimony, and vermilion. Harmful? Very. Some of their less frightening side effects include headaches, mood swings, and insomnia, but they can also cause organ damage. Ceruse, a white mineral and ore of lead, is mixed with vinegar and used as a skin whitener. It damages the skin, so the more you wear it, the more you have to put on to cover up that damage. The tutors are aware of the problems it can cause. Those women who used about their faces do quickly become withered and grey-headed. 
One Giovanni Lamazzo writes in 1598, Because this doth mightily dry up the natural moisture of their flesh. It also causes hair loss, which might be one of the reasons that wigs and the very high forehead will come in vogue later in this era. Ah, the things we do to stay fashionable. Some people have posited that Elizabeth I's increasingly volatile temper as she ages is because she is slowly being poisoned by her beauty products. So, it's a good thing the vast majority of us won't be messing around with any of that. Now we slip on our shoes, which are likely to be sturdy leather with fairly thick soles, and we're ready for action. Can you believe we haven't even left the house yet? Next time, we'll talk about the Tudor social structure, then roll up our sleeves and get to work. See you then. Thanks for listening. If you like The Explorers, tell a few friends about it or leave the show a review. It all really helps new listeners find it. You can also become a patron, which I would appreciate greatly. I'd like to thank some of my wonderful patrons who really help keep the show going. My newest pirate queens, Lauren T. and Joelle. My newest boss ladies, Amy, Annabelle, and Anna. And Monique L., Bethany, Bronwyn, Elizabeth, Grace, Hillary and Brian, Melissa, Michelle, Nuria, Sarah, Rebecca, Tanya, Jessica, Sophie, and Julian. My adventuresses, Helena, Alexis V, Alexis M, Carlos, Iris, Jessica R, Jessica S, Karen, Amber, Kelly, Lizzie, Phil, Samantha, and Stephanie. My warrior queens, Lori and Avery, my imperial empress, Faye and Whimsy Soapworks, and my lady pharaohs, all three of whom are named Courtney. Love you, Courtney's. For just a few dollars a month, patrons get prizes in the mail, early access to all my episodes, full interviews, polls, Q&As, as well as exclusive bonus episodes you won't find anywhere else. To find out more, just go to my website. Thanks so much to Ruth Goodman for time traveling with us. You can find her at her website, ruthgoodman.me.uk. At the moment, you can watch pretty much all of Tudor Monastery Farm, the show I referenced several times on YouTube. Make sure to check out Ruth's fantastic books. I'm only as good as my sources, and Ruth's book, How to Be a Tutor, was a vital resource in crafting this episode. Also, take a look at her newest, The Domestic Revolution, which explores the fascinating history of how introducing coal into Victorian homes changed everything. It's one for the season one fans amongst you. The period-appropriate guitar music you just enjoyed comes courtesy of John Sales. For show notes, including a transcript, images, and a list of my sources, just go to my website, theexplorespodcast.com. You can also find me on Instagram, that's my main social media game, Twitter, and Facebook. Thank you, as always, to Mr. Explores for my theme music and logo, and Neil Hobson for his excellent vocal stylings. <laughs>